if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is just the beginning. In space is the inescapable challenge to all the advanced nations of the Earth. And it will establish the United States as the preeminent space-faring nation. First for the coming decade, for the 1990s, space station freedom. And next, for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, and this time, back to stay and then a journey into tomorrow, a journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. Back to the future. These words might have been more than a speechwriter's choice slogan. A space base on Mars, in the future or in the past. There is evidence that a space base existed on the planet Mars in antiquity. And what is even more startling is that it might have been reactivated before our very own eyes. Is it possible then that what our civilization is discovering today about ourselves, our beginning, our planet, our corner of the universe, even the heavens, is a drama that could be called Genesis Revisited? only a rediscovery of what had been known to our earliest civilizations? The last decades of the 20th century have witnessed an upsurge of human knowledge that boggles the mind. Our advances in every field of science and technology are no longer measured in centuries or decades, but in years, or even months. They seem to surpass in attainment and scope anything that man has achieved in the past. Man came out of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, reached the Age of Enlightenment, experienced the Industrial Revolution, entered the era of high-tech, the era of genetic engineering, the era of spaceflight. Space shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. We copy you down, Eagle. The Eagle has landed. Astronauts who land like eagles. In antiquity, they were called Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came. The possibility that modern science is catching up with ancient knowledge has brought mankind to the first chilling incident in a war of the worlds. It rekindles a situation that has lain dormant almost 5,500 years. The incident of the Tower of Babel. In the Babylonian version of the biblical story, the people of Babylon were building a tower whose head shall reach the heaven, in which a Shem, a space rocket, was to be installed under the direction of their supreme god. But the other deities were not amused by this foray of mankind 
into the space age. Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the humans were building. And he said to unnamed colleagues, this is just the beginning of their undertakings. From now on, anything that they shall scheme to do shall no longer be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they should not understand each other's speech. Genesis chapter 11. I'm Zechariah Sitchin. I devoted a lifetime to the study of ancient civilizations, ancient languages, their art, their beliefs and the knowledge that they had. And the question is, when you study, when you look at all that, is it myth, is it mythology, or did it really happen? I believe it all really happened. You are invited to join me in a journey, in a journey in a time machine, a magical journey taking us to the past through the work and achievements of archaeology. Ancient knowledge. How much did they really know? How much do we know about them? Thanks to archaeology, we now know that man's first great civilization blossomed out almost 6,000 years ago. Older than the Greeks. Older than the Mayas. Older than the Incas. Older than the Egyptians. The oldest civilization in our history. The people who bequeathed it to us are called Sumerians, after the name of their land Sumer, in the great plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, today's Iraq. The book of Genesis called that land Shinyar. For many years, the references to ancient kingdoms in old scriptures were either ignored or disbelieved, considered simply myth. We now know that they were historical records of real, flourishing, and incredibly advanced cultures. We are now entering a temple that is actually 6,000 years old. It is a temple that existed in a city called Erech, uh, which until about 150 years ago was known only from the Bible, the biblical book of Genesis. And that temple was dedicated to a goddess, to a female called Inanna, known in later times as Ishtar. You can see here her features, a little damaged. Her divinity was marked by the pair of horns that she had. Uh, she held a jar with the water of life. And uh, she was surrounded as a decoration, but perhaps also symbolically, with a symbol that some refer to as entwined snakes, which was the symbol of science in, in those days, 6,000 years ago. Uh, some find in it a precursor of the Egyptian Anch, which was the symbol of life and creation. And it really was a symbol of genetic manipulation of DNA. She also engaged in other activities, among them flying in the skies of Earth and also being an astronaut almost 6,000 years ago. In ancient Mesopotamia, the secrets of celestial knowledge of astronomy were guarded, studied, and carefully handed down by astronomer priests. They often kept this special knowledge on cylinder seals like this one. This clay tablet is the print of a seal about 4,500 years old. It depicts the scene of the god Enlil granting to mankind the plough, the beginning of modern agriculture. 
But very interestingly, we see at the top here, as the background of the cylinder seal, a depiction of the complete solar system, with the Sun in the centre, and all of the planets we know of in their correct order, with their correct sizes. Plus, one more planet, which is still unknown to modern science, but is being actively searched for, because it does exist, as astronomers now concur with ancient knowledge. The heavens bespeak the glory of the Lord, and the vault of heaven reveals his handiwork. In August 1977, the American space probe Voyager 2 left Cape Canaveral on a journey that would eventually take it, several years later, to the vicinity of our solar system's outermost planets. What Voyager discovered once it arrived there fully corroborates ancient knowledge. Oh my God, for the first time man is actually seeing Uranus. And it is exactly as the Sumerians had described it 6,000 years ago. Yes, no doubt, though they had no telescopes, the Sumerians did describe Uranus as Marsh Sig, meaning bright greenish. The Sumerians also explained why Uranus is tilted. Uranus took an almighty bang early on. A collision with something the size of Earth, traveling at 40,000 miles per hour, could have done it. What a strange feature. Is it artificial? Was someone there on distant Miranda in the past? The Sumerians called Uranus planet which is the twin, the twin of Neptune, that is. Were they right? Now we can confirm the Sumerian description of Neptune as a blue-green planet. Obviously, the Sumerians must have known. Is it possible that mankind is only just catching up with ancient knowledge? That the Sumerians were particularly at home with astronomy is evidenced by the fact that they had known, named and listed all of the planets we know today, including those we ourselves rediscovered only in the past couple of centuries. Nudimud, the artful creator. Anu, he of the heavens. Anshar, foremost of the heavens. Kishar, foremost of firm lands. Rakish, the hammered bracelet. Lachmu, their god of war. Ki, the seventh planet, we call it Earth. The seventh planet, the sacred number seven, seven days in the week, seven days of Genesis, seven tablets of creation. Sumerian cosmogony answers many puzzles that still baffle modern science. Central to it was the tale of a celestial collision and knowledge of a solar system with 12 members. That ancient knowledge included the planets Uranus and Neptune, supposedly unknown until discovered in 1781 and 1846, and even Pluto, not discovered until 1930. But most surprising, was the inclusion of one more large planet as the 12th member of our solar system. 
The story of this planet, as told by the Sumerians on their seven tablets of creation, begins four billion years ago, when our solar system was much younger and our own planet Earth did not yet exist. Out of deep space, there appeared an intruder called Nibiru. Drawn into the center of our solar system, passing by Neptune and Uranus and Saturn and Jupiter, it faced an olden planet called Tiamat. When Nibiru, traveling clockwise, came close to Tiamat, which was traveling counterclockwise, its satellites struck Tiamat and cracked it. In a series of collisions, one half of Tiamat was smashed completely into bits and pieces. It became the comets and became what the Bible and the Sumerian epic called the firmament, what we call the asteroid belt. The other half, what we now call Earth, was thrust into a new orbital position. It carried along Tiamat's main satellite, which became our moon. Nibiru itself was caught into a permanent clockwise orbit around our sun, returning to our neighborhood once in every 3,600 years and forever becoming the 10th planet of our solar system. This tale of creation echoed through all the ancient cultures, becoming part of the scientific knowledge that we find in the Old Testament in the creation story of Genesis. Modern astronomy and recent discoveries corroborate this millennia-old tale. So, according to ancient knowledge, Earth was not originally a member of the solar system. It was the cleaved-off half of Tiamat, the planet destroyed in the celestial collision. And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land Earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called Seas. This is what the ancient peoples firmly believed. What does modern science have to say? Missing crust, half of it missing, sunk down and lies some 250 miles below the Earth's surface. The most obvious place for the missing crust, where planet Earth was wounded, is the Pacific Ocean, now seven miles deep. How deep was it 200 million years ago? How large was the wound 500 million years ago? One billion years ago? Four billion years ago? What caused the wound? A cataclysm. Seven tablets of creation, seven days of creation. Anunnaki, Elohim, Enuma Elish, Genesis. When in the heights heavens had not been named, and below earth had not been called, Naught but primordial Apsu, their begetter, Mamu, and Tiamat, she who bore them all. Their waters were mingled together. No reed had yet been formed. No marshland had appeared. Enuma Elish. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 
Genesis chapter 1. If we apply the knowledge of the Mesopotamian text to the biblical text, the correct reading of the book of Genesis emerges especially with regard to waters. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, dividing the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. Upper waters, lower waters. What did the Bible mean by that? What has modern science discovered? The Sumerians described Uranus and Neptune as watery planets. In 1979, 1980 and 1981, the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft visited Jupiter, Saturn and their many moons and found water everywhere, as ice on the surface and as water below the surface. There was water on Io, a moon of Jupiter, and on Jupiter's moon Europa, on Saturn's moon Enceladus and its moon Tethys and in the magnificent rings of Saturn. Modern science has confirmed the ancient assertion to the full. There indeed have also been waters above the firmament. A most spectacular corroboration of the presence of waters above came with the return of Halley's Comet to our vicinity in 1986. Water loss at 30 tons a second increases enormously. 70 tons a second. Don't worry, it has enough water left to last thousands of more orbits. The core, half the size of Manhattan Island, contains melted ice. Four billion years old, 90 million miles away from the Sun. Halley's Comet has been visiting us roughly every 76 years. Was it known even in antiquity? The unusual celestial object reported in Babylonian texts to have been seen in the year 164 BC is believed to have been Halley's Comet. Significantly, it was considered the scepter star of Israel. I see it, though not now. I behold it, though it is not near. A star of Jacob did course. A scepter of Israel did arise. Numbers 24, 17. Halley's Comet and its likes are truly the messengers of Genesis. And what about waters below the firmament? Data obtained by unmanned spacecraft in the 1970s and again in 1990 and 1991 reveal that Venus may have had seas, lakes and rivers in the past. Even Mercury, so close to the Sun, had an icy past and still has water ice at its poles. When the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli announced last century that he had seen canals on Mars, he was disbelieved. So was the American astronomer Lowell in 1916. But the unmanned spacecraft sent to Mars by NASA found evidence of ample water in that planet's past. We are forced to no other conclusion but that we are seeing the effects of water on Mars. Mars once had enough water to form a layer several meters deep over the whole surface of the planet. 
So, what had started out as a dry and barren planet has emerged in the past decade as a planet where water was once abundant. Mars has joined Venus and Earth in corroborating the Sumerian concept of water below the firmament. Anunnaki, Elohim, Enuma Elish, Genesis. Of all the mysteries confronting mankind's quest for knowledge, the greatest is the mystery called life. The Sumerians asserted that the seed of life was brought to Earth from space by Dibiru. Were they right? Life on Earth began when stray comets carrying the building blocks of life crashed into the primitive Earth. Scientists find evidence for this in meteors falling to Earth. What we are trying to find out in the meteorites is to see whether there are any of these molecules related to life. There are certain molecules like the amino acids which may be described as the building blocks of life. What does that imply is that all those events that led to life may be common in the universe. Directed panspermia is reviving the notion of seeding the earth with the first organisms or spores from an extraterrestrial source. Not, however, by chance, but as a deliberate activity by an extraterrestrial society. 3.8 billion years ago, a primordial gene might have appeared, whose message was the biblical injunction, go out into the world, be fruitful and multiply. This would be possible only in the case of extraterrestrial origin. Thus did evolution begin. As we read in the Bible, it was only after all the fishes of the sea and all the fowl that fly the skies and all the animals that fill the earth and all the creeping things that crawl upon the earth, it was only then that Elohim created the Adam. We are not the oldest story of evolution, only its last few pages. Let's get back to the Sumerians' oldest writings. We read that their creators were the Anunnaki, the people who had come to Earth from Nibiru. In advance of their landing on Earth 445,000 years ago, they sent their robots to scout the unknown planet. One hundred and fifty thousand years later, the Anunnaki created man. They made us Earthlings to mine in Africa the gold they needed to save their home planet's dwindling atmosphere. How was the Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, a fertilization in vitro in glass tubes, as depicted in this rendering on a cylinder seal. Adam was the first test tube baby. Let us make the Adam in our image and likeness. Genesis 1.26 They made us in their image. Therefore, they are like us. They have a far developed space technology. Nibiru comes into our vicinity every 3,600 years. And then, they revisit us. Every time they give us opportunities for a sudden technological jump, for better medicine, for a greater science, for a better agriculture, as they have already done in our recent and ancient past. According to the Bible, the Babylonians once tried to reach their gods in heaven, the Anunnaki, by building the Tower of Babel. Today, we would call it a launch tower. 
What was the target of that endeavor? According to Zechariah Sitchin, it was Mars, our neighbor planet. The 12 members of our solar system were identified in Mesopotamia by specific symbols. Some, as for Mars, Earth and Venus, indicated their position numerically, as on this ancient stellar. We see the sun with its many rays. We see the symbols standing for four of them in the bottom row. We see another four depicted standing on their cult animals, but really it's a symbolism connected with the zodiac. We see the moon and we see the earth symbolized by the seven dots, which indicated the position of the earth from the outer limits of the solar system, counting or coming in inwards by somebody flying into from outer space. The seven dots of Earth and its crescent moon and the six-pointed star of Mars are revealing clues in this 4,500-year-old Sumerian depiction. It shows two figures standing on either side of a craft, a spaceman on Earth on the left greeting a spaceman on Mars. Running water must have existed on the Red Planet in relatively recent times, geologically speaking. Some believe Mars may have been habitable as little as 10,000 years ago. In the 60s and 70s, the United States launched the Mariner and Viking spacecraft to explore Mars. In one area, called Cydonia, among other puzzling features, a stone carving was seen that looked amazingly like a human face. At other sites on Mars, features could be seen which resemble enigmatic structures on Earth. This is a feature on Mars that NASA nicknamed Inca City. Saxahuaman, Peru. Mars. Nazca, Peru, attributed to the gods. I was especially intrigued by independent researchers' suggestions in their reports that the orientation of the face and adjoining pyramid indicated they were built in alignment with sunrise at solstice time on Mars about 450,000 years ago. According to my conclusions, the Anunnaki had first landed on Earth about 450,000 years ago. It was perhaps no coincidence that the two dates coincide. The only plausible theory is that someone, neither from Earth nor Mars, capable of space travel almost half a million years ago, had visited this part of the solar system and had left behind monuments both on Earth and on Mars. The only beings for which evidence has been found are the Anunnaki. The Sumerian tablets refer to the station planet Mars as the traveler's ship. I've taken it to mean that it was at Mars that the Anunnaki from Nibiru transferred to smaller spacecraft to reach Earth orbiting stations. Not once every 3,600 years, but on a more frequent schedule. The actual landing on and takeoff from Earth were performed by smaller shuttlecraft. From some other species from another planet. Mars, sometime in its past, was the site of a space base. The unexplained, abrupt end of a Soviet space mission in 1989 suggests that the ancient space base has been reactivated. In October 1988, the Soviet Union sent two spacecraft to investigate Mars, named Phobos 1 and 2, after one of Mars' two moonlets.
Although launched by the Soviets, the mission actually represented an international effort of an unprecedented scale, with more than 13 European countries participating officially, and British and American scientists participating personally, though with their government's knowledge and blessings. Phobos-1 was somehow lost on its way in September 1988. But Phobos-2 did make it to Mars and operated perfectly, sending back to Earth images from the surface of Mars. On March 1, 1989, these pictures of a highly strange grid were received. The grid, here in the upper right, was shot both in the optical and in the infrared range. Later, they were merged into this composite. And here is what this amazing grid looks like once the optical image is enlarged. Then, for the next 24 days, no other pictures were released. On March 26, Phobos 2 sent back images, taken just south of the Martian equator, of this uncanny elliptical shape. aligned with this long linear strip, stretching for 300 kilometers. March 27, the Soviets announced sudden problems in keeping radio contacts with Phobos II. March 30, the Soviet evening TV news Vremya. Добрый вечер. Так и хочется сказать и начать этот комментарий со слов в эфире сенсация, но все по порядку. Сегодня в течение дня мы получали очень много сообщений, в которых говорится о том, что за рубежом западные обозреватели говорят, что советская межпланетная станция Фобос потерпела неудачу, катастрофу и программа, международная программа, в которой участвуют 14 стран, сорвана. Но а что говорят факты? This here represents a unique phenomenon. Before now, no one had ever taken such detailed infrared pictures of Mars. Съемка происходила в, одни, в один и тот же день. Вот, но эта тень появилась действительно неожиданно. То есть это похоже на тень. Почему? Потому что под ней видны, виден сюжет. Виден, да? Да, виден все. сюжет. То есть это не предмет, висящий над поверхностью, а это, видимо, тень все-таки на поверхности планеты? Наверное, наверное. Ну а все-таки идет... вот это вот эллипсообразное образование, это трудно сказать, на поверхности трудно. Марса или это в атмосфере висит что-то? Трудно или сказать это... в том смысле, что... То, что это не лежит что-то, это абсолютно точно. Это похоже на ракету, взлетающую с поверхности Марса, и после которой еще остается инверсионный след. Как вы к этому относитесь? Ну, если дать волю фантазии, то, конечно, можно найти и такие объяснения. Но мы склонны видеть совершенно реальные, хотя, может быть, еще до конца не объясненные обстоятельства, которые породили вот такой вот след. Скорее всего, это все-таки тень от какого-то объекта на поверхности, потому что сквозь тень просвечиваются элементы поверхности. Сколько потребуется времени, чтобы обработать вот эту всю информацию и получить уже более-менее объективные, действительно научные, а не, фан а не фантастические результаты? Через неделю приезжайте. Без этого я реализуется следующий момент. Мы сегодня находимся в самом тяжелом Если действительно вообще о проекте рассказывать. Какие же точности получены? Были определенные точности заданы, это минимально необходимые точности для того, чтобы на изображении появились такие пятна, которые очень хочется трактовать как появление летающей тарелочки в поле зрения термоскана. Но надо сказать, что версия летающей тарелки принадлежит не нам. Это очень хотелось, чтобы так это все было в действительности. С самого начала мы говорили о том, что Конечно, здесь никакой тарелки нет, и, конечно, и, и, то, что мы видим, объясняется вполне понятными, естественными физическими причинами. 
Five months later, in September 1989, British Channel 4 runs a new special on the Phobos mission to Mars. Last year, the Soviets launched two spacecraft to the planet, both named after the Martian moon, Phobos. Their mission was to photograph Mars and land probes on its moon. One was accidentally switched off by a mission operator. But the second reached Mars and transmitted pictures that are still puzzling Soviet scientists. As it swung over the equator, it took pictures from a height of 6,000 kilometers. This is an infrared photograph. It shows differences in temperature. The dark patches are colder. This section covers 600 kilometers. It shows objects down to the size of two kilometers. It's the most detailed infrared picture of the planet's surface. We have some very, very thin lines on the surface of Mars in the infrared, which means it's heat. I mean, it's not visible, it's heat. You can see it through clouds if you wanted to. These have a resolution, these have a width, I would guess, of three or four kilometers wide. Now, in answer to the question of what it is, I certainly don't know, and the Russians aren't telling us. Scientists are also puzzled by this shadow pictured on the surface of Mars by both optical and heat-seeking cameras. They're convinced it's a shadow because they can see objects on the surface beneath. But a shadow of what? Finally, there's the mystery of the vanishing spacecraft. The Russians have yet to release the last picture transmitted by Phobos before it lost contact with ground control. But the Russians have said that it shows an object coming towards the spacecraft, an object which, in their words, should not have been there. The spacecraft was circling Mars, coming into the same orbit as the moons of Mars. And the last picture, about they got halfway through it, and they saw something there which shouldn't be there. Professor Kapitza makes the joke that it's Martian people. British scientists will be able to judge for themselves when the Soviets bring their pictures to a conference at Exeter next month. Because, of course, there must be a sensible explanation, mustn't there? But the Russians brought no pictures to Exeter. So, what about the spacecraft's disappearance? One possibility could easily be that a small meteorite, a small bit of rock, was in the same orbit of Phobos and hit it. But in an exclusive interview with us in October 1990 in Moscow, Professor Lev Mukhin of the Soviet Space Research Institute discredited the dust theory. Uh, различными организациями в нашем институте, в частности, они показали, что это предположение малосостоятельно. If not dust, then what? A long spell of silence followed until, in December 1991, former cosmonaut trainee and retired Soviet Air Force Colonel Marina Popovich held a surprise press conference at the Russian consulate in San Francisco where she showed off this photograph, reportedly taken by one of the Phobos craft. It shows in the foreground a strange shape, which Marina Popovich called an unidentified flying object, what we refer to as a UFO, clearly set off against what appears to be Mars moonlit Phobos in the background. So, what about the mysterious shadow? Well, the Russians said it turned up all of a sudden, that it was something that shouldn't have been there, a shadow of some object above the Martian surface. But that's not all. In April 1992, as we examined these other images, all taken within minutes from each other, we discovered that the shadow had actually been moving. So the mystery remains, what caused the spacecraft to destabilize? Was it a malfunction or was there an outside cause, perhaps an impact? 
The question that arises is indeed a simple one. Was the spacecraft Phobos II hit by something that put it out of commission? The circumstances in which Phobos II was lost suggest that someone might be back on Mars, someone ready to knock out what to them is an alien spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If we can go out into space, could someone from space come here? When NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft in 1972, it attached to it a golden plaque. With this plaque, Pioneer carries a message to extraterrestrials about its home planet. Its symbols show the radio signature of our sun, where our planet is located and what we looked like. As Pioneer 10 journeys on beyond the outer known planets, the data it is sending back is also being used to seek a possible 10th planet. Indeed, a March 1992 NASA press release stated, Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of 4 to 8 Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond 7 billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. Maybe uh, you wish to tell us in a few minutes the nature of those discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. And as a matter of fact, the date on here I was just noticing is um, 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced the hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. And this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing. And that's when you, you sent me this book. You have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some, some, some time aeons ago uh, of, of a, a celestial body which you, I think, named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or, or, or somehow uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escaped satellite of Neptune. This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. It will take the orbit of the satellite near Reed and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Uh, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was an, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. In the, We've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. 
I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture, at least in your own mind, of what we are talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh. But if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then it's, its mass will be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's, that's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for on the tenth planet, and here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet, yes. and uh, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in biblical time, and that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now, and, uh, which is, again, approximately the area that we're looking in. If planet X exists, we are not alone in this solar system. Astronomers are so sure of the 10th planet, they think there is nothing left but to name it. Alone he stretches out the heavens and threads upon the farthest deep. He arrives at the Great Bear, Orion and Sirius, and the constellations of the south. He smiles his face upon Taurus and Aries. From Taurus to Sagittarius he shall go. The books of Job and Amos. Is modern science really catching up with ancient knowledge? Modern science has indeed caught up with ancient knowledge of Nibiru and the Anunnaki. And man knows once again that he is not alone.